I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. And uh, on your screen, you'll see Alison and Alison Metcalf, uh, Professor Alison Metcalf. And Alison works for an organization called LOHA. And Alison will explain what that is. And um, she's going to be talking to us about um, support and family communication in families where there's Huntington's and also be talking about an upcoming course uh, that you might be interested in that, that LOHA are going to, going to run for us. So, Alison, is it okay if I, if I just hand over to you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. So, good evening, everyone, um, and thank you very much for inviting me to to come along and 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 speak uh, this evening. Um, I really appreciate you you, you giving up your time. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to do is is talk a little bit about uh, some of the research uh, that I've done in the past, um, and and explain a, a little bit about. Um, the, the work that, that I've undertaken uh, with many families um, affected by Huntington's disease, but also uh, other um, genetic conditions. Um, and then um, talk about how we've sort of developed interventions really to support families and support family uh, communication and families' mental health uh, in, in dealing with Huntington's. Um, so uh, my background is uh, quite um, uh, sort of eclectic. It draws on uh, both clinical uh, and uh, academic uh, research. Um, I've worked with families for uh, over 30 years now, um, uh, looking at how families uh, sort of can communicate more effectively, um, manage distress and, and, and managing uh, sort of uh, fears and anxieties around talking about difficult subjects. Um, and thinking about how they can manage their mental health. So if I could talk a little bit about some of the, the, the research that we um, have found in the in the past, um, um, particularly around sort of Huntington's disease, um, one, the, there's a number of things that we've found very consistently that families have reported back to us. And we've literally... Um, interviewed um, many different families in many different sort of situations and settings uh, and this would also include families in the UK but also families uh, in, in sort of wider European networks um, and because I, I, I also link in with uh, sort of various uh, projects across Europe as, as well as uh, in the UK and um, there are a number of really sort of common things that really emerge and, and, and come together quite frequently. Um, there's understandably a lot of emotional distress about talking about Huntington's disease in the family often. Um, many, many, it's one of the things that really worries parents knowing when and how to talk about uh, the condition with their, with their children and young people uh, uh, in the family. Um, there's often a uh, great concern about whether or not uh, they should wait until the young person reaches adulthood before they really explain about the risks of Huntington's disease or whether, you know, in fact, they should talk talk and explain things to the, to the children. And that's been a, a sort of feature that's, that, that's um, that, you know, that's, that's remained very consistent in certainly in all the years that I've been researching in this field. Although I would say that um, I, I think gradually more and more parents are rec recognising and valuing uh, the openness of being able to talk. Um, I also think there's, there's, there is um, the there's, there's sort of stress on family relationships that the actual uh, Huntington's disease cause and the, the strain uh, that it can put on, on, on uh, family members and, um, and families. Uh, in general, um, the you know the sort of neurological um, uh, uh, symptoms of the of, uh, Huntington's disease um, can you know cause uh, a family member to behave uh, in unexpected ways, can cause, it cause them to do unexpected things, and many um, uh, you know young people can find it uh, sort of very uh, upsetting and very embarrassing, uh, particularly if a parent. Uh, has Huntington's and, and and is behaving in a way uh, that they really can't explain to their their uh, friends. So that there can, um, you know, obviously be those those sorts of issues. 
and um, and then of course it's also you know it's also generally the effect on of living with the condition the effect on family members um it, it can be extremely stressful uh living with one or more family members with huntington's disease and um and that can cause an, you know an enormous amounts of sort of um anxiety uh, um uh, upset there's a lot of anticipatory sort of grief um, and the changes in the person, person and personality of, of, of a loved one uh, can, you know, be really quite challenging. Um, and also, um, then, as I said, it, you know, the, the other big question really is about having sensitive converse, sensitive conversations around Huntington's uh, disease, knowing when to talk to children and young people, uh, and helping them think about how they learn to cope. Uh, with uh, the risk of Huntington's disease, if there is a risk uh, to to them, um, uh, and also you know cope with uh, the the care that they need to offer and give to to family members. So there's lots uh, to sort of think about there. And when we sort of began to talk um, to, to parents uh, um, and carers around. Um, what some of the fears were about talking about Huntington's disease with young people. Um, these were some of the common fe fears that came out really. Um, they were, first of all, deciding on the right time. That was a major issue uh, for many um, uh, parents and carers. But one of the things that, that also came through really quite strongly was that they were very worried about the emotional reaction of the young person. They were worried that uh, the young person would would blame them, would be angry with them, um, would, uh, and would really react uh, uh, sort of against uh, the parents, and um, and so it's a, a really a very strong uh, reaction of fear. Many parents also told us they were worried about their own emotions, how they would talk, but they were worried about breaking down uh, and, and getting very upset um, in front of the children and young people and the impact that that uh, might have. Um, and um, there, there were sort of questions about whether or not the young person might really resent their, their parents because if, you know, if they were uh, at risk from uh, having, uh, of carrying the Huntington's uh, gene, um, you know, there would be a, a certain amount of resentment and anger that the parents would have to deal with and they were unsure about how they would deal with that. I think the other thing was, in, in terms of deciding on the right time, um, many parents said they were worried about the impact it would have on the young person's schoolwork um, and particularly, you know, as many young people you know, they've got the pressures of exams and of changing schools and, and all the things that are, are involved uh, with, with, you know, sort of generally growing up. It, 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 that was a fear of, of choosing, you know, fears about choosing the right time uh, because of that. Some some parents were, were simply um, afraid of, of an unknown response that the they not knowing and not being able to predict how their their child would react react if they started to talk to them about Huntington's, um, that was a major issue. Um, and then the other thing was was googling. Um, many parents said to us one of the reasons that they they didn't necessarily want to talk um, directly to their their children was that they were afraid that they would go out straight away and start googling. Uh, and then start reading all about Huntington's disease and, and reading all all the you know sort of worst case scenarios um, rather than being able to talk to their, their child and, and, and trying to put some kind of perspective around living with Huntington's and, and what that were, you know actually meant um, rather than you know some of the uh, stories that you you read on the on the um, uh, internet so so for me, for one of the things that I would say is that over the, the period of time that we've done this work, I think one of the things that's become increasingly um, apparent is that ideally, um, if you can talk to 
to, to young people, talk to children and young people about Huntington's disease, gradually sort of telling the, the child or young person more in an age appropriate way, that is probably the best uh, way of um, of helping the, the child or young person understand and come to terms uh, with, with uh, Huntington's disease and, and its risk to themselves. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen over uh, the last sort of uh, 10 or 15 years is a, increasingly um, the recognition that by trying to sort of hold the information and keep the information from the child or young person, often that can be very distressing for the young person because they don't understand what's happening and they actually imagine things being far worse than they actually are. I think the, that what we've seen also is that there are now many different impacts uh, on, on young people's mental health because of things that they see and hear and don't understand and are not able to put into perspective. And therefore, I think one of the things that I know I've certainly um, realised more and more as I've done this work is the need to actually uh, be able to talk uh, to young people um, in, in a sort of age appropriate way um, and, and be open to discussion about and, and be transparent about what's actually happening in the family. That is the, the sort of best way to really guard against uh, long term uh, sort of mental health problems. Because one of the things I think we've increasingly become to realise is the majority of poor mental health is actually the result of distress. And whether that's a conscious uh, or a subconscious realization around that distress, um, it, it's it's become more and more apparent um, that if we don't give um, people in general, let alone young people, um, the opportunity to articulate their feelings uh, and their thoughts uh, and actually sort of process them, um, then they can't really have the same opportunity to overcome distress. I think the other thing is that um, as this sort of um, uh, realisation has come about, um, I think that there are sort of more organisations and more charities now that are beginning to, to support um, many families. And, and we're, you know, we're seeing more and more, more support offered. Um, although I think that there is so much needed that you know systems are very much um uh yeah un under severe stress in trying to offer the, all the support that's required um and uh, during the the time that i've been working uh, so i've been working with families over the last sort of 13 or 14 years really looking at how we can design interventions that help uh, parents uh, communicate uh, more effectively uh, with with their, their children and with with their teenagers uh, to explain about Huntington's disease um, and to sort of really give parents the skills that they need to communicate effectively uh, so they can sort of uh, explain and manage the distress feelings, helping young people uh, think about their feelings and how they want to process them, but also helping the parents themselves to really um, uh, process their own uh, thoughts and feelings and to be able to and, and to feel supported in terms of how they uh, help uh, children and young people. And one of the things that um, uh, I've done during this time is that I, I became more and more uh, conscious of the fact that people needed more help and more support and there often isn't the, the systems in place uh, to provide that. Um, and so um, myself uh, and a, a, a group of my colleagues have basically come together to form uh, an organisation called LOHA. Um, and LOHA is working uh, very much with parents uh, to develop parent skills uh, and insight and understanding about how they can help uh, their the young people, their teenagers, how they can help them 
sort of uh, managing their feelings and thoughts and overcome uh, distress and learn to manage their mental health much more effectively. And um, um, we do this through a number of ways. Um, so one of the one of the um, sort of most effective ways that we have been able to really help families communicate much more effectively is using something called systemic therapy. Now, systemic therapy basically means system and, and how the whole family system works together to really support and help each other. And, and, and family therapy is a form of systemic therapy. And so one of the things that we, we've been doing over the last sort of 15 years is thinking about how we use a systemic therapy to really support uh, that, that sort of um, family communication to help people have those difficult uh, conversations or sensitive conversations. And um, we've been working um, really to sort of highlight the importance of more open family communication and some of the key skills that are needed uh, to do that and, and you know one of the things that we've been finding is that parents absolutely are absolutely brilliant are at, at um, developing these skills if you know if they're given access to them and if they're given uh, uh, you know a, a way or they're given the insight that they need to to be able to deliver on them and some of those skills are you know learning to listen without judgment um, love and respect for all family members and learning to sort of balance uh, different family members' needs and competing family member ne members' needs at, at different times. Um, helping families work together, to grow together, because that builds trust and that, uh, and that builds a, an interdependence and a, and, a, and a level of support between all the family members that are, that's um, really important and really sort of fundamental uh, to really good mental health. Um, and we know that, um, you know, if family members work together, one of the things that we can do is use systemic therapy to help families find the stories, find uh, the narratives that they might have around um, who they are and where they can, where they can draw support from. And that increases um, both the young persons, but also uh, the parents' resilience uh, in understanding where they can get help and where they can, uh, can draw support. Um, and and um, that sort of psychological support, as, as well as sort of physical aspects of support. And I think one of the things that we see is that if, if families develop these skills, um, because it, they are skills that constantly can be developed, it's really great because as families change, as as different care needs are, are required, um, it can really help all the family members change their, their sort of position and continue to grow and change and evolve uh, as they as they need to. So I think it's it's um, you know systemic therapy you know has has been really helpful to me, to many of the families that we've worked with. And one of the things that we've seen as we've sort of worked um, in this way, and and we we did a lot of this work initially face to face. So we would run workshops um, and um, and sort of um, you know meetings and. Um, uh, uh, various sort of uh, therapeutic uh, workshops um, that we offered, um, and one of the, uh, and there were a number of things that we found uh, around sort of in increasing that sort of more open communication uh, between family members. We found that if if families had a sh shared reality of what was happening in the family, um, that really helped sort of families work together um, and. Um, it really helped a lot, you know, families' mental health, um, because when people, young people don't understand what's happening, uh, that can cause a lot of tension, a lot of stress. Um, and, and you've actually, you, you actually create, uh, you know, a lot of um, potential conflict uh, within a family because people don't have a shared reality of, of what's actually happening. 
Um, with more open communication, there's more psychological safety. Family members trust each other, uh, and they know that they've you know basically got each other's backs. That they 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 can work together. There's a sense of solidarity. Solidarity. They're in this together. Uh, and again, that's a really important part of, of coping uh, and, and sort of uh, being resilient uh, in times of, uh, of difficulty and in times of challenge. Um, the more open you are about uh, Huntington's disease, it reduces uh, a lot of the stigmatisation that can happen um, um, and, and challenges people's sort of uh, stereotyping and perceptions. And I also think um, one of the other things that we saw, and, and and I've seen this continually whenever I'm working with families, is that when families are able to talk about what's actually happening, new perspectives bring new insights, they bring new, new ways of doing things. Uh, and that in itself can be very sort of um, uh, beneficial, uh, especially when family members might need a lot, a lot of care or a lot of support. Um, and, and I think it brings together that sort of mutual support uh, that we really see, you know, in sort of uh, strengthening families. Um, through much of the work that we've done, um, I think one of the things that I and my colleagues have always been very keen on is, is helping families recognise their own strengths. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of the work we do is helping them discover um, and recognise the strengths that they've got and that they can draw upon um, and because you know sometimes it comes from the most unexpected places and I think you know it, it, it's it helps people sort of grow and grow in confidence um, and grow in confidence in, in knowing uh, what to ask for so so you know these are some of the many benefits really uh, of talking about it uh, more openly and, and as part of the work, one of the one of the things that we've increasingly seen is that I think there are four uh, pillars um, of good mental health around sort of being more open and, and having more uh, open conversations. And we do that through something what we've called it the CURE framework. And CURE is simply the terminology that I use so that I can remember uh, uh, all the four components because I've, I've got a terrible memory and I, I do forget things very easily. So the four components are connection through curiosity. Um, and so, what, you know, the, the many of the interventions that we've designed, we really encourage family members to be curious rather than be judgmental about things, encourage them to ask each other questions, encourage, encourage them to, to think about things and not, not assume that they know how someone else is thinking or how someone else is feeling. But you know, if you can get people to the point where they're, they're really curious uh, about how another person thinks or feels in the family, that can open up all kinds of different avenues of, 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 uh, of support uh, in a two-way sort of process. It also increases the understanding that you have of each other within the family. And I think that's, that, you know, is something that we really underestimate. All, all the work that we've been doing recently with families is many of those families have come back and said to us, um, the activities and the, uh, the uh, systemic therapy that we offered actually dramatically increased their understanding of each other and, and understanding how, why people were thinking the way they were and why the people young people particularly behave the way that they did um, and I think that understanding and that, and that empathy sort of really grows uh, through the, the, the work that we do with, within systemic therapy and then also then the, the fourth uh, aspect of the pillar is the resilience and I think the resilience comes from being able to really sort of recognize your strengths grow your confidence and also grow the strengths and the confidence of the of the young person, um, because if they can see that the where they can draw uh, help and support from, and where they can see you acting as a role model uh, for that um, that confidence uh, and that empathy and that understanding, that is is hugely beneficial uh, in helping the young person uh, with their resilience. 
So, so uh, part of the work um, that we've been doing uh, with with Loha, um, we we recognise quite uh, well even prior to the pandemic, um, we were getting. I was asking, being asked to do lots of more workshops uh, around this and lots more support uh, around the work. And I just haven't physically got the time uh, to be able to do it. And so I began to look for alternatives. And about five years ago, I began to explore um, whether or not we can do some of this work um, digitally and whether there are digital technology would enable us to, to do the work um, so that we could um, get more care and more services uh, out to everyone that was requesting help. And um, after the, the pandemic had sort of um, finished, I'd, I actually decided um, to leave the university sector uh, and, the, and the clinical sector where I was working um, because I, I really believe that we could do something different uh, and offer something really different that would really make a difference and really help families. Um, and so um, I uh, left and met up with uh, two of my colleagues um, and we formed LOHA. And we have been building sort of digital technology, we've been working with families to sort of co-design um, the digital technology to be able to deliver the systemic therapy that I, I've just been talking about. And we we really, you know, we could really see that the need for this innovation and, and saw that it was really important. And so um, we took evidence-based and effective systemic therapy. We um, wanted to build on the family's own strengths and, and, uh, and look at where we could help, you know, them uh, sort of, so that they didn't need to necessarily attend appointments or attend uh, workshops. We, we tried to look at what we could deliver to people's own homes because we, we also know that's really important. Um, and we, we wanted it to be accessible. So it was there when families felt it was needed. And also we wanted it to be uh, uh, cost effective. Um, and as I say, and that's that's where we saw the birth of of, of Loha really, and uh, and what we've begun to do is is develop um, a whole range of different activities um, that basically uh, you um, do together. So um, it, it, there, it's a, a uh, I say it's a chatbot, but it's more sophisticated than a chatbot. But basically, it's like a, a digital therapist. Uh, is delivered to your phone um, one activity a week each week for six weeks and the idea is that that um, parents receive the activity and then together as a family you do that activity together and the activity uh, allows you to sort of really get into uh, much deeper conversation probably deeper than what you would normally do a, a, as a family just sort of uh, sitting around in, in general but because you're you're doing something together um you, uh, you actually um are able to sort of talk much more openly uh, and in a sort of much more sort of controlled uh, way and and i think you know what you simply do is follow the digital therapist prompts um and and read the instructions uh, and then do the, do what the sort of digital therapists guide you to do, and that the the activities are very carefully chosen. They're based on all the activities that we do uh, in person um, uh, as part of the system, systemic therapy workshops, but these are are done uh, on a digital basis. <clears throat> and as I said, you you get uh, one activity. Um, a week for six weeks we leave a week between each activity for a very important reason and that is that one of the things that we find is that the families when when you're doing the activities together um there'll be lots of things that come up and you talk as part of that sort of process of, of doing that activity 
But then what we also find is that two or three days after the activity, some of those, some of the family will want to talk to you about uh, things that sort of came up during the course of the activity. Um, and so it's really important that you just have that week's um, break for the, the sort of activity to sort of consolidate, for the activity to really um, embed and, and, and give everybody time to really think and process um, what the activity uh, as how that's helped you as a as a family how and and it, and give you the chance to sort of answer any questions that might have arisen and as part of laha we you know we also give access to free ebooks uh, um and uh, and then there's sort of any ongoing support at the end of six weeks so that there are other activities and things that you can do but we we start off with this really um very fundamental um six week program that really sort of builds trust um um enables you to have really in depth uh conversations um and really learn much more about sort of uh supporting them and each other and and sort of, you know managing uh, emotions and and um and and processing thoughts uh, as you go through um, so the, the digital activities, um, they sort of, uh, you know, as I said, guide parents and carers. Um, um, and I think one of the things that, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, of the feedback is uh, from parents of, uh, that they've told us is that by working uh, through the activities, it allows them to really get much more insight into how their, their child or teenager is thinking and they 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 feel much more deeply connected uh, you know only today i had a a, a message from uh, a, a a mom and she said that she she'd been really struggling and, and she'd used the one of the activities with her 9 year old because she'd been really struggling to understand what what you know why he was very anxious about all kinds of things and she said i can't you know i can't believe it i did the activity with him she said, and it was just like it. it she said his his face just lit up as he was doing the the activity, uh, and she said it suddenly became much more apparent to me, you know, why he was struggling. I could see that, you know, it, she said he confided into me the problems he was having at school, um, and the problems he was experiencing with his teacher, and she said we had a conversation at such a deep level. She said, I, I, I've not felt that level of connection for such a long time. She said, with my with my son, she said, I just I just can't thank you enough. And, you know, and, and that's what we're trying to do, um, you know, with you and your, and, and your families um, around Huntington's disease is really, you know, get that connection and, and get that support so that, that family members can feel, um, you know, that they can openly talk and uh, about what's happening. Uh, and um, and be able to sort of express themselves, uh, and, 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 and you know just just share what's happening for each other, um, and and yeah, and and so all the activities, um, you know that they're they're designed in such a way uh, as as to be very sensitive, but but do help you talk about sort of sensitive subjects. Um, and situations and of course you know that would be included uh, for, for Huntington's disease and I think the other thing that to say is that you know, over the period of the six weeks that that we don't suddenly say you must talk about Huntington's here or we don't suddenly bring up um, Huntington's disease during the activity one of the things that we try and encourage you to do is take naturally occurring opportunities uh, as as part of the sort of conversations, because I think one of the things it's really critical to do is is uh, is is to you know is not to get sort of worried uh, and, and sort of feel that you've you know you're anticipating that you've got to be able to to talk about this by a set time by a set point. I I think the more natural uh, naturally occurring opportunities that you can have uh, around this. Uh, and by just even giving uh, the, your your teenagers the you know the chance to be able to ask the questions, 
that you know that in itself will be very very powerful and lead quite naturally to to uh, more in depth discussions. So you're probably wondering about what the activities include. Um, and, and when I said to you that you know you're you're you'll be doing the activities and sort of talking at the same time. Um, and so the activities that you that are, you're guided through you, they involve sort of drawing. They might might be note making notes. Uh, it will get you discussing uh, different things in in relation to emotions and feelings, uh, and how people interact or don't interact. It will also um, get you reflecting, um, and uh, but also acting and planning. And so really sort of building on all those different skills uh, and course uh, core skills that that um, that you often need uh, to, to sort of really help you uh, manage uh, sort of emotional uh, uh, and, and um, uh, mental health. Um, and I think that, you know, the really great thing about these activities is that they they really get the young people to recognize their strengths. Uh, and to talk about, you know, much more openly about their feelings and what they're thinking, and 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 that in itself is, you know, is hugely beneficial uh, to them. We, you know, we've seen it time and time again in this. Um, so yeah, so that that's just the acronym uh, for cure. Um, so the other thing that we've said is uh, uh, while we're working uh, with the Huntington's Disease Association, because uh, the, there will be um, 10 places um, on, on um, a programme that the Huntington's Disease Association uh, have, uh, have paid for us to de deliver. Um, the other thing that we will, we will do um, is uh, we're offering a coaching session online. So. Uh, every Friday morning at at ten o'clock, uh, myself or one of our therapists um, will be uh, online, and we will, uh, you know, answer your questions. We'll give you any sort of further support or advice that of you know from anything that's arisen uh, during the course um, of the activities. Um, and it's entirely up to you. You can come on to those um, sessions and be completely anonymous. You needn't give any of you, any personal details, or you can, you know, form part of a group and and um, and and that group will meet every Friday morning for for six weeks uh, at, at ten o'clock. Um, and I think one of the things is then that um, you know parents can learn from other parents, but but also. Uh, you know, we can sort of, uh, you know, give you any further support or advice um, that you might need. Um, I've, I've got a little animation just to show you um, about what, because I think it's quite difficult for people to get their heads around what what is actually involved. Um, and it's it's very diffi difficult to show uh, a session in real life. And we, we, we really struggle to think how to portray um, what, what we actually do. Um, and so what we did was create this uh, very short 90 second uh, animation that sort of explains a bit more about Laha. So so this animation, um, it talks, it it's uh, really sort of um, designed for uh, young people uh, with anxiety and depression. But, but um, the activities that we've done for uh, families affected by Huntington's disease, um, they, you know, they, it's a very sort of similar process. So I, I just wanted to show you this so that you get some idea of what actually happens. Um, so if I put that forward. I was really worried about her daughter, Sophia who had become anxious and withdrawn, often retreating to her room after school, desperate but facing a two-year wait for CAM's help, and discovered LOHA, an organisation supporting parents to help their teenagers manage mental health through a blend of human and digital resources. LOHA offers evidence-based programmes, combining guided activities designed for bringing parents and teens together to talk about feelings along with support from online sessions for parents. 
Anne attended an introductory online session and was impressed with the in-depth, practical advice immediately available. And she enrolled in the LOHA program. The activities which Anne and Sophia could engage in at their leisure utilize creative and visual ways of helping them develop curiosity, deeper understanding and empathy with each other. This deeper communication enables Sophia to express her thoughts and feelings openly, helping Anne provide targeted support and strategies for resilience. With Loha's ongoing support, Anne watched Sophia transform into a confident teenager, enjoying life and able to process her feelings more easily. Anne said, something special happens here. Visit our website to see how we can help your family grow stronger together through cure, connection, understanding, resilience, and empathy. So, um, so yeah, so, so at the end, that's basically the programme, and I can answer sort of any, any questions that you've got about it. At the end of six weeks, um, as I say, parents uh, will you know, graduate from the programme but I think one of the things that we want to say is that you know you you, you won't be alone we we still uh, carry on we still support uh, many parents um, and we we have a sort of uh, a small subscription um, that means that we can carry on offering advice and support uh, through a, a sort of a joint peer network um, and and we can certainly uh, do that um, uh, specifically uh, around Huntington's disease as well and and uh, its management. Um, I, I think I've explained, uh, you know, that uh, when you sort of uh, join uh, LOHA, uh, basically you can do that anonymously. So you can sign up. We don't ask for any any personal inf information. Um, one of the things that we are very keen to sort of stress is that, um, you know, when we're not in this to sort of harvest your information or harvest your data um, uh, or, or anything like this, this is purely, um, you know, in terms of purely anonymous uh, in terms of how much or how little uh, information you want to share with us. Um, as part of some of the activities, we do ask you to, to simply give information um, because in terms of filling out sort of questionnaires. And that's um, but again, it's anonymous. We don't we don't associate the, the information with your personal uh, details in any way. Um, it's 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 mainly to show whether or not we have had the, the sort of improvement and we've given you. The level of support that that, um, that you know we we want to give you and, and make sure that uh, we've helped you uh, in terms of uh, achieving what you need to achieve. Um, and so you know uh, you know as I said, there's no no personal information in there. I think the, I think the most that we we would ask you is to uh, let us know who's taking part in an activity. But then it's not we don't want any names. We just want the relationships of who's involved. So it might be, you know, mom, dad, um, two daughters and one son or, you know, something uh, similar to that. Um, and these are some of the testimonials um, that we've had um, in the last couple of days, actually, um, um, of people that are sort of using um, uh, the the um, uh, digital activities that, or the digital therapist, um, um, and yeah, hopefully they speak uh, for themselves uh, in terms of, of of you know people really sort of giving us lots of very positive feedback. Um, and people really welcome the fact that, you know, they can just use them, they can use them at home uh, and they really, they really seem to make a, a difference. So Deja in, in terms of, uh, you know, a large numbers. Um, but what we found is that um, every family that we've worked with to date has reported, a, 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 you know, a sort of significant uh, improvement uh, in, in, their, in their communication. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, the, their teenagers' mental health and well-being. 
Um, so hopefully you've had time to have a read at that. Um, if you want any more information, please don't hesitate to contact uh, me. Um, there's my uh, email address there in terms of um, uh, getting further help and further support. There's our website um, and there's our Instagram and also our YouTube information. And as I say, we, we do um, we do work with families, for, you know, with a with a wide range um, of uh, genetic conditions, but also a, a families with, you know, a, a wide range of sort of mental health issues as well. So there's, you know, there is a lot of information uh, about supporting and helping families more generally as well. But but the programme that we do for the Huntington's Disease Association will focus uh, on Huntington's disease uh, and certainly uh, all the follow all the um, online coaching sessions on a Friday morning uh, will be uh, specifically around Huntington's disease as well.